Welcome back to a course on Calculus RS Integration. In this lecture, we are going to see a theorem which states if f is monotonic on the closed interval a, b and if alpha is some continuous function on a, b, then the function is Riemann Stelzer's integrable. This is what we are going to prove in this theorem. Okay. In general, what are the things that we have? If you recall from the previous uh, lectures that we have seen, this f is always a bounded function. Okay, this is a basic assumption that we have. Along with this boundedness, we have included monotonicity as well. Okay, and alpha is, alpha in general is monotonic increasing function. In addition to this, we have included the continuity to this. So, with which, what are we going to prove in this theorem? The function f is Riemann tells us integrable. Okay, let us proceed to see how we prove this. Okay, uh, given f is monotonic on the given interval a, b and alpha is continuous on a, b. Okay, and let us take epsilon be given let epsilon be some given small positive quantity now for any positive integer n we choose a partition p such that delta alpha i is alpha of b minus alpha of a upon n where i runs from 1 to n is this possible yes this is possible since alpha is continuous since alpha is continuous, we are able to do so. In general, uh, what we do is that we have an interval a, b and if this interval has to be split in uh, n equal terms, then we take delta x i to be b minus a upon n. This is possible. But what we have here is this is some interval a, b and alpha is generally a monotonically increasing function. It is also given that it is continuous, which means it has to be something like this okay this thing here uh, if you find a sorry sorry uh, let me do it again so we have something of this sort right it starts somewhere anywhere okay it is something like this so which means what This has to be split in equal intervals. If this has to be split in equal intervals, this may occur at different points. One point may be here, one point may be here. This may, this may not be mutual. Like it goes like this and slowly goes like this. In all these things, you may notice that this function is monotonically increasing. Okay. This has to be here. Uh, this point and this point. Okay. Uh, let me erase these things off. Now, we will have to split alpha in equal terms. If we have to split alpha in equal terms, if you look at, okay, let me do it in another color. That will give you a clear idea. Okay. These things are fine. Okay. If you take somewhere here and you have equal intervals means this has to be somewhere here and this will be somewhere here. Okay. These are larger quantities, but this is somewhere here okay so this will be somewhere near so we are remember that we are splitting this alpha into equal intervals for which there is some corresponding uh, elements in the interval a b and that in that points we collect under the partition b. okay we are able to do so only because alpha is continuous if alpha is not continuous we are not able to do like this Right now, uh, for the simplicity purpose, 
let us suppose f is monotonically increasing you may ask why can't we assume f is monotonically decreasing yes we may assume that too doing the same arguments we can prove for monotonically decreasing case also right suppose f is monotonically increasing uh, uh, function if f is monotonically increasing function let this be my uh, x i minus 1 and let this be my x i in this interval my supremum is going to be what this part right uh, sorry this is alpha right so f is also assumed to be monotonically increasing if f is more okay using the same thing we we shall consider this for uh, f also f is also some monotonically increasing function right so in this case you may see that your supremum will occur at the right end point and the infimum will occur at the left end point hence uh, your mi will be what f of xi and small m i will be f of xi minus 1 and this is true for i runs from 1 to n ok if f is assumed to be monotonically decreasing function the reverse would happen big m i would be uh, f of xi minus 1 and small m i would be f of xi that's it that would be the only difference right Thus, uh, up f alpha minus lp f alpha is what summation i runs from 1 to n big m i delta alpha i minus summation i runs from 1 to n small m i delta i right and this is what summation i runs from 1 to n f of x i okay uh, this one let us write it as mi minus small mi multiplied with delta alpha i okay we shall write this way and uh, that is actually what we are calculating upf alpha minus lpf alpha this one is summation i runs from 1 to n big mi minus small mi multiplied with delta alpha i and uh, what is delta alpha i it is alpha of beta sorry alpha of b minus alpha of a upon n this is what we have chosen as delta alpha i right for all the i this is going to be the value so we just substituted it and that quantity is independent of i hence we may take it outside alpha of beta minus alpha of a upon n and summation i runs from 1 to n what is m i it is f of x i and this is f of x i minus 1 only this and this is alpha of beta minus alpha of a upon n and this is going to be what when you start with f of 1 you would get f of x1 minus f of x0 plus f of x2 minus f of x1 plus f of x3 minus f of x2 and it goes till f of xn minus f of xn minus 1 so here these terms gets cancelled and we will be left with only f of xn minus f of x0 and xn is nothing but b and x0 is nothing but a so this is what we have okay initially we have chosen epsilon be given okay which means epsilon is some negligible positive quantity for here we have till this right so for sufficiently large value of n we get this quantity this entire quantity to be less than epsilon so upf alpha minus LPF alpha is less than epsilon for sufficiently large n, right? So this is less than epsilon, and that tells by the necessary and sufficient condition of RS integrability, your F is 
RS integrable. And this completes the proof. Thank you.